The swell machine takes a break while El Nino continues to build. I'm Mark Sponsler, and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, October 22nd. Storm Surf. Waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. Be sure and like and subscribe. Ring the bell. You get automatic notifications when the videos are posted, typically on Sunday evenings. Just click the Storm Surf icon down in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. You'll get those automatic notifications. And if you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up. We appreciate it. And if you'd like to make a contribution, you can. Hit the special thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. And with that, I'd like to thank the folks that donated last week. Coach Nate, of course, always thank you so much. Jason Modem, always again, great. Uh, Centered Surfing, thank you for your contribution. And Sean Burke, we really appreciate it. That's a very generous contribution. And with that, let's get to work. We'll start by looking at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean. We see a gale, really more of a low pressure system here, north of Hawaii, generating... 16, 17 foot seas aimed at the islands. It's been hanging out for the past couple of days, moving from the North Dateline region to the southeast. Definitely producing some swell bound for the Hawaiian Islands, but not a whole lot is expected for the U.S. West Coast from it. Next up, we'll take a look at current conditions. We'll start in Northern California using the buoys. Point Reyes buoy, number 029. We're looking at all the energy that's hitting that buoy all the way up from uh, super long energetic swell p energy, 33.3 second period. There's a tiny bit effectively none. Uh, and then we see a bump here at about 15 seconds, and then a bunch of wind swell down underneath that. Putting that all together, we see primary swell is four feet at 10 seconds from 282 degrees. That's that wind swell, which would make surf about chest high, four foot, something like that. Then there's also some secondary southern hemi swell, 2.8 feet at 13.7 seconds. That's from about 210 degrees. Uh, when you get a bunch of wind swell in there, it kind of confuses the buoys. So anyway, and that puts surf at about waist to maybe chest high and uh, saw some waves about that big today. Then we go down to Southern California, Point Loma South Buoy 191. Again, the same profile. We see a more pronounced peak of that Southern Hemi swell uh, with peak period at about 15.4 seconds. And because of the Channel Islands blocking the wind swell, a much smaller signature there. Putting that all together, primary swell 2.9 feet at 14.9 seconds from 209 degrees, which would make surf about 4.3 feet, or we'll call it chest high or shoulder high. And I think uh, many spots down in the southern end of California were about that big. And then you have your wind swell at 1.9 feet, 11.3 seconds. Then we go over to the north shore of Oahu, buoy 106 at Waimea Bay. Again, looking at the energy there, which there is effectively none. Uh, look at primary swell, 1.8 feet at 9.9 .9 seconds. That's two foot, and that's, that's probably about right, and virtually no other swell. So things settling down, believe it or not, end of October, and the primary swell is southern hemi swell. Interesting. So let's go take a look and see what's been going on as of late. We're going back to Thursday, the 19th of October. A little gale developed. Now, I guess we can't go without at least acknowledging the mega swell that hit, what was it, in Northern California on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And I think Southern California, it lingered pretty good into even Saturday. Uh, peak pure swell in Northern California was somewhere around 11 feet at 21 seconds on Wednesday afternoon, solid uh, 20 foot at many locations, and pretty much untouchable given the extreme long period, just way too much water moving around, uh, a swell for heroes only. Um, and now 
that has all settled out. That swell is pretty much all but gone, maybe heading down towards South America, but that's about it. And now we have a little gale that started developing Thursday, the 19th of October here over the northern Dateline region. And by gale, just barely, I mean, we'll call it really 30 knot winds, produced 20 foot seas there Thursday evening, and then seas in the 16, 17 feet into Saturday. Kind of pulsed again a little bit this morning with uh, 18, 19 foot seas aimed at the Hawaiian Islands. And there we are as of right now. And then we go down to the Southern Hemisphere. On Wednesday, the 18th of October, a gale developed. I mean, this is pretty amazing. We were sound asleep all summer, and now the Southern Hemi decides to at least be stirring. Maybe not super impressive, but it's trying. Gale developed under New Zealand with 32.6 feet. These are the highest seas over the entire domain here. 32.6 feet and then proceeded east, sort of fell apart. And then I think another one, there we go, as of uh, Saturday, developed with 33.9 foot seas aimed off to the northeast, and then proceeded off to the east, faded from there, and that's where we are as of now. That means two swells are heading northbound for both Hawaii and California. So at least something to ride while we wait for the North Pacific to come back online. So what's coming after that? Well, we're going to start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales when they form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, and we have one right here, a dip in the jet to the south. That helps create an eddy in the upper atmosphere, a counterclockwise circulation that also manifests down at the ocean surface. That's the hallmark of low pressure. And of course, low pressure, if it's strong enough, generates winds. Winds, as they get traction on the ocean surface, generate seas. Seas, as they radiate away from the fetch area, eventually turn into swell. And swell, when it hits your beach, of course, turns into surf. So we have the jet pushing hard up into the Bering Sea, a little bit unusual, then falling hard south north of Hawaii, creating this trough, and that is supporting that low-pressure system and those seas that we saw um, just in the last frame. And then sort of diffuse, pushing into California. There is actually some rain, this push of the jet right here, driving some rain into the San Francisco Bay Area, but very light, you know, maybe two-tenths of an inch or something like that. So we put this into motion. That trough continues north of the Hawaiian Islands. I mean, this is mainly a swell produ producer aimed at the Hawaiian Islands, driven by this these winds in the jet here pushing this way. That put, puts all the momentum in the western quadrant of whatever ever load develops here and aims at the Hawaiian Islands. So anyway, that continues, sort of pinches off and fades as we get into Tuesday, the 24th of October. And then we kind of sit for a moment then the jet tries to organize again. Not very strong. Notice there's a little pocket of 140 knot winds. But a couple of uh, week and a half ago, whenever we got that uh, trop uh, extra tropical storm uh, boulevard, we had much stronger winds, probably in the 150 to 160 knot range across the whole North Pacific. Anyway, we get another little trough forecast Thursday north of the Hawaiian Islands, doing almost the exact same thing that's happening right now. And then as we get into next weekend, the jet don't, no longer pushes up into the Bering Sea, starts running more due east off of Japan. And we'll see how this plays out, whether that is a more productive, whoops, more productive pattern. But you see there, winds building at 130 to almost 140 knots, two-thirds of the way across the Pacific. And the expectation is they will push on to the east at some point, looking more normal for what we would expect for this time of year. All right, so let's go down to the surface. Take a look at surface level pressure and surface level winds. Here's our current low. Not even, yeah, it does have 35 knot winds wrapping around. So that qual qualifies it as a gale. But no, none of that stronger fetch aimed at Hawaii or the U.S. West Coast. So we get into Monday. It continues to circulate a little bit, but pretty much doing the same semi-anemic thing and then just fades out completely. As we get into Friday, another gale tries to organize here off the Kuril Islands, but pretty weak. Sat and then Friday night, another gale in a trough that we saw forecast there, just north of Hawaii, producing 35 knot winds, almost 40 knots there for a minute. And then that fading out on Saturday and then that, oops, there we go. That's the end of the run. 
with another gale over the Kuril Islands. But in general, a weaker gale pattern driven by a weaker jet. Um, we think that is going to be short-lived, but no guarantees. Here's the effect of those winds on the ocean surface. Our current low, 20.3 foot seas, but up here, not aimed south at Hawaii. These seas here are about 16, maybe 17 feet aimed at Hawaii. So effectively, wind swell rather than ground swell pushing towards Hawaii. And you see no fetch aimed at the U.S. West Coast. So nothing really going to come of that. Put this into motion. The gale continues. Maybe a last little push of minimal 19.5 foot seas on a Monday late morning, then that whole thing kind of fades out. Yes, we have some fetch there, but it's all aimed up at the Bering Sea of no interest. Another little system tries to push off uh, Japan as we get into Friday, but seas 18 feet. And then the next system north of Hawaii on Saturday, 19-foot uh, seas aimed at the islands from a rather north direction, so maybe a little bit of something from that. But nothing, again, aimed at the U.S. West Coast, so a quiet pattern, at least coming from the North Pacific. Now, in the South Pacific, here's remnants of a gale that we just looked at that pushed under New Zealand uh, earlier this weekend. That's to be fading out. But as we get further into the work week, Somewhere around Thursday, late Friday, some weather system is to develop under New Zealand. This morning's run of the model had almost 30-foot seas aimed up at uh, Hawaii and the U.S. West Coast. But this run, yeah, there's 32 or 3-foot seas there, but my guess is they're aimed more at Antarctica and probably not going to do a whole lot for us. This system over here, east of the California swell window, and we're out now a week. and not surprisingly, the Southern Hemisphere shutting down. Local wind forecasts for California right there, San Francisco Bay Area, Point Conception, Southern California down there. Weak little low pressure system you can see today pushing into Northern California. A south wind regime, not horrendously strong or anything, but still kind of bumpy and warbly along the North California coast. But as we get into Monday, you can see high pressure building in. The typical pressure gradient clearing high pressure. Northwest winds start building at 20 to 25 knots, mainly off the coast of California, but still probably pretty windy near shore. South wind regime for the Hawaiian Islands. So we get into Tuesday, same deal for California. Northwest winds in control and some sort of like southwest wind pattern for the Hawaiian Islands with low pressure in close proximity to the islands. Wednesday, the wind regime lets up for California, but still blowing pretty good for North California down to maybe Monterey Bay. A lighter wind regime for Hawaii as we get into Thursday. Again, light northwest winds for the uh, northern Cal north and central California coast and some sort of, you can barely see it here, but there's some south wind barbs at about five knots there for the Hawaiian Islands. Friday, another low pressure system north of Hawaii, mixed wind regime, high pressure rebuilding along the California coast, 15, 20 knot um, northwest winds. Saturday, northwest winds continue. Uh, north winds for the Hawaiian Islands. Nobody's getting a break. We're all suffering. And then more northwest winds for California on Sunday. And tr trades trying to build in. We'll call them northeast winds for the Hawaiian Islands, at least only in the 5 to 10 knot range. So maybe uh, select spots will be able to tolerate the wind. And then rain forecast for California. You can see the rain over, well, the San Francisco Bay Area is there, maybe down to San Luis Obispo. Very light rain at that, and all clearing out as we get into early tomorrow morning, and then clear after that. But notice this little system here starts pushing south over the California-Oregon border on Wednesday, and remnants of it push down over the Sierra. And notice white and theoretically snow and uh, maybe 18 hours worth. Seems hard to believe. Probably a reach for the models. And then after that, things dry out. But it is kind of interesting just to see that. For laughs, let's go look at the snow forecast. 
Here we are, the snow forecast dashboard for the Olympic Valley, nearly a foot of snow. And let's just see when the date of that is. That is on Wednesday night into Thursday. Um, pretty impressive if it does happen. Seems hard to believe. Snow level, this is the uh, parking lot at Olympic Valley. This is the summit at the top of, uh, so that'd be up at the top of Granite Chief or um, the top of Palisades. You can see the reds are liquid precipitation, the gray sleet, the white is hard freeze and blue harder below that you see it dipping the freeze level dipping well below the base that little spike there means liquid or some sort of precipitation hitting at the same time wednesday night into thursday morning then the snow level after that actually stays just above or the freeze level i guess i should say just above the base if not falling below the base again as we get into the 29th and the 30th and then after that things start warming up a bit not a not unusual pretty typical this time of year things start getting cold it looks like a winter or at least a late fall pattern is trying to set in for the sierra just looking at one other resort mammoth mountain just further south you see how much snow they get maybe an inch or two at best all get since it's a system falling north to south it's all going to get wrung out by tahoe maybe down into kirkwood in that area by the time it reached mammoth not a whole lot left surf spot forecast we're going to go ocean beach in uh san francisco area now this is the weird thing with the models you can see here this is wind swell if it's like short period wind chop it shows up but if it's too generated too close to shore the model doesn't even sense it you see surf heights of like two feet three feet and then you got the spike of seven foot it's probably more like in the five foot range sort of thing during all that wind um, but let's go look at the swells. But there's your seven feet at nine seconds. But there's remnant southern hemi swell lingering Monday. It was hitting today, fading on Monday from a foot and a half at 14 or 15 seconds. Then you have your wind swell just kind of going through. But then way out here, you see 16 second, almost 17 second period intervals and some size showing up. That is the first of the two southern hemi swells previously under New Zealand. Let's go take a look in Southern California. It should be more obvious there. We go to Dana Point. Now you see the wind swell completely just shadowed there by the Channel Islands, but then all of a sudden you see surf heights jumping to two and a half feet, and that's just, you know, like at a beach break. That's not counting any bathymetric enhancement for reefs and things like that. We can go look at the swell situation. I mean, there's the last little bit. It actually probably, of the southern hemi swell, probably goes even into Tuesday. But we're down to one foot at 13 seconds by Wednesday, so that's all gone. But then you get into Saturday, and boom, here you go. 1.5 feet at almost 18 seconds on uh, Saturday afternoon, and coming up from there. So at least some southern hemi swell to look forward to. And then we go to Oahu. And we know for sure there's some sort of swell energy pushing there from that gulf north of the island. I mean, that gale north of the islands in the gulf. You can see uh, wave sizes, surf sizes in the six to seven, eight feet. That's probably pushing it a bit. But certainly swell for Monday, Tuesday into Wednesday and then fading from there. Pure swell, six feet. That's probably a little bit on the high side. Six feet at 12 seconds, probably more in the 5.5 at 12 sort of thing. But either way, waves are waves. You take it where you can get it and then things settle down after that. All right, let's go take a long term. What's going on uh, with our forecast? The two major weather oscillations that we look at are the MJO, the Madden-Julian oscillation, and the El Nino Southern oscillation. And so they work together or apart from one another and are the major influences of the jet stream and therefore the storm track over the North and South Pacific. So the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, it's like a mini El Nino almost. There's two phases to it, an active phase and an inactive phase. The active phase is a low-pressure system. The inactive phase, a high-pressure system. They rotate around the planet from west to east like this on the equator. 
When the active phase is over the Pacific, it dampens trade winds, and what it also does is it take a warm, moist air that's down at the ocean surface, lifts it high up into the atmosphere. That gets tapped by the jet stream. It energizes the jet stream, and then the jet stream becomes more apt at producing storms. The inactive phase of the MJO is a high-pressure system. It does the exact opposite. It builds high pressure over the Pacific, which then in turn uh, increases trade winds, and that in turn um, doesn't do anything for swell production. The other thing the active phase of the MJO does is it dampens trade winds when it's over in the West Pacific, and as it moves east, it drags that dampened trade winds with it. What the net effect of that is, is they call them westerly anomalies. It's like west winds. In fact, if it's strong enough, it can create west winds and reverse the trade winds. That, in turn, takes warm water that's all balled up over in the far west Pacific on the equator, starts pushing it east, not on the surface, but underneath the equator in what's known as a Kelvin wave, a ball of warm water that traverses the Pacific from west to east. It takes about three to four months to go from New Guinea over to Ecuador, but eventually it hits the Galapagos Island in Ecuador, erupts to the surface, creating a warm water slick there. If you get successive active phases of the MJO, they create successive Kelvin waves, which is exactly what we've been going through since almost December of last year. And then you get this big pile of warm water building up off of Ecuador. That in, start, that start, in turn starts changing the atmosphere above it, and that is the setup for El Nino. We've had six Kelvin waves so far, a seventh is developing, and maybe an eighth after that if the models are, are right. So we are in prime position for Kelvin waves and the active phase of the MJ, I would say that with some qualification here, to usher in El Nino. Uh, the qualification is, at some point, if you're in an El Nino pattern, the MJO just disappears, and El Nino turns into like this long-running active phase of the MJO, and it just starts driving the Pacific nuts, pu pushing piles of warm water to the east, feeding the jet stream, changing the global upper level and surface level circulation, and creating storm after storm, pushing in uh, north of Hawaii and into the U.S. West Coast. We have our eyes on that. We saw the classic first signs of that with uh, extra tropical storm Bolivan, uh, we uh, not even a week ago, a few days ago. And so now the North Pacific's taking a break, but we expect that something will pop up pretty soon and it won't be just a little run of the mill sort of storm, but we'll keep our eyes on that. But let's get back to what we're at the task at hand. We're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO and or El Nino, since they're sort of synonymous if we're, you're in an El Nino scenario. We are. Uh, we're looking at data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino. They have wind sensors on them. This is the East Pacific here. This is the West Pacific there. There's the equator. There is the date line right there. We're just looking at the arrows. We see trades out of the East Pretty, the longer the arrow, the stronger, so moderately strong. Same thing over the Central Pacific, moderately strong trades. And then you get here into the West Pacific, and one you see, this is water temperatures, a big old ball of warm water there. And we see west, not westerly anomalies, full-on moderate to strong westerly winds over here over the West Pacific. Sure wish all the rest of this array was up so we could see what was going on, but we have a pretty good idea of what we think is happening. Now, it's not the actual winds that matter, though this looks great as it is. It's the anomalies, difference from normal for this time of year. Looking here in the East Pacific, trades are pretty much normal, if anything, maybe reversing a bit here on a couple of sensors right there. You get to the Central Pacific, dead neutral, but you get over here in the Kelvin wave generation area, the West Pacific. This is where if the Western anomalies are present, this is where you generate your Kelvin waves. Can't do it so much over here. It's got to be in the West Pacific from about 170 West on over 
over the Dateline to a point in the, as far in the West Pacific as you can get, and just five degrees north and south of the equator. So we'll just draw a box right in that area. You see out and out just strong westerly anomalies. This is great news. The west wind pattern for the past five days, uh, South America, Central America, New Guinea there, equator right there, Dateline right there, the oranges and reds, westerly anomalies. You can see this was on the 16th of October, westerly anomalies almost over the entire equatorial Pacific, continuing on the 17th, the 18th, morphing a little bit on the 19th, and still continuing on the 20th. Very impressive. Also notice easterly anomalies here over the maritime continent. I say that and I draw your attention there because we've been talking about the Walker circulation, the development of the work Walker circulation. There's an upward branch and a downward branch. It seems like the downward branch is hitting somewhere right around, oh, maybe here at 170, 165 east with east anomalies. If it falls downward like that and the winds convert, uh, disperse out in either direction, Westerly anomalies on one side, easterly anomalies on the other. And you see it turns into this sort of permanent pattern. That's how you get the consistent westerly anomalies over the West Pacific during El Nino. And this is starting to look like that. In fact, let's dig a little deeper. Here's the zonal wind anomaly pattern for the next two weeks from the GFS model. Um, the reds and yellows, westerly anomalies. The blues and purples, easterly anomalies. Now, this is the whole plan on one chart. Datelines right up the middle. The far west Pacific starts about 125 east, so right about there. Okay. Kelvin wave generation area ends about there, 170 west. So this box right in here. Now, you see we've had westerly anomalies and strong since October 12th, but even they started the beginning of October. They are scheduled to blow hard into almost the beginning of November. We got this little tiny finger of easterly anomalies forecast for, I'll give it one, two, three, four, maybe five days. And then you see the building westerly wind, and these are strong westerly winds building on the date line again. Now, also again, that same deal, the downward falling branch of the Walker circulation, easterly anomalies raging over the maritime continent, the dividing line between the two, somewhere here right about at 125 east, the entrance point to the West Pacific. So the downward branch is there, we think. Let's keep digging. Next up, outgoing long wave radiation, cloud cover. I'm not sure why we're even showing this anymore, but we're going to do it just for fun. We might drop it. Normally, when you're just looking for any sign of the active phase of the MJO, it becomes important. But when we're sort of in the situation where we are now, where El Nino is building, the MJO is all but disappearing, you just see you have this dry air pattern over the maritime continent from those easterly anomalies. This is for, for the statistic model. And really no sense of any precipitation, just drought over Australia. That's from the statistic model, dynamic model suggesting the same thing. And we don't think that there's really going to be any change in this for months to come. The phase diagrams for those two models, statistic model here, dynamic model here, and just how do you read this real quick? MJO moves, active phase moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean to the Maritime continent, the West Pacific, East Pacific, under the United States, across the Atlantic, over Africa, and back to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active, active phase is. If it's inside or near the circle, it's considered to be extremely weak. Uh, it, when you're Getting the beginnings of El Nino, you want to see active phases like way out on the edges of the chart and preferably in the West Pacific. But today, active phase extremely weak over Africa. The three different paths for it have it moving to the Indian Ocean and continuing extremely weak. The dynamic model basically saying the same thing. MJO really not in play anymore. The major mode of variability for the Pacific Ocean right now appears to be El Nino, and the MJO has all but gone to sleep. In fact, you can see that pattern here. This is not does not show you the position of the MJO, the active phase, but it shows you the strength of it. And so somewhere starting around December last year, 
The MJO started waking up here. We got a couple of nice spikes here in uh, all these. Well, let's see, March, April, May, June. And then as we got into July, you see the MJO just boom, disappeared. But that was because each of these active phases of the MJO, and that was an exceedingly strong one there, um, have produced Kelvin waves that have basically kicked off El Nino. Then the MJO goes to sleep, El Nino takes over, and uh, it is certainly taking over. All right, so here's the forecast going out a month. This is 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies from the CFS model, not the GFS model, the CFS model. We see the same pattern here. Date, dateline runs right up the middle here. Kelvin wave generation area here in the West Pacific. This is past performance. You see a, uh, oh, and the solid black contours are the, that's the last active phase of the MJO that back there in, we'll say, August. The MJO all but disappears, but you notice starting somewhere here about mid-September, westerly anomalies just started continually building. Very strong as of the past week or so. Forecast to continue very strong for the next week and a half. Maybe moderate a little, but still moderate to nearly strong for the next month nonstop. That is not an MJO signal. That is an El Nino signal. We want to see that. That's what we've been waiting for for months. It appears to finally be here in earnest. Also notice the east wind pattern here over the maritime continent. Very strong. Again, it's that downward falling air hitting the surface and splitting going in either direction, creating your westerly anomalies over the West Pacific, and in this case, filling the entirety of the Pacific in pieces, maybe starting a week from now and going from there. And then this extremely dry air, um, easterly anomaly pattern over the maritime continent. Um, pretty much, uh, they call this the positive phase of the Indian Ocean Dipole. But for our purposes, this is smelling very much like El Nino. Outgoing long wave radiation not forecast, this is actuals, all right? Remember we talked about that downward falling branch of air uh, over the maritime continent, the Walker circulation. That would be very dry air. You can see that, well, okay, Let's. this goes back a year. Let's get oriented first. Here's the date line, okay? That downward falling branch of air right there, this is, the, the reds and oranges are very dry air, not supportive of cloud cover or precipitation. The blues are moist, wet air. So this was the downward falling branch over the date line back in late last year, the early part of this year, with all the moisture over the maritime continent in Australia. And then somewhere around April, you can see that whole thing shut down. And you look at this here, you see the dry air pattern starting to build and quite strong now over the maritime continent, while the wet air pattern here starts shifting to the east, building over the date line. So we had a pretty good little patch here in October, thinning out a little bit right now, but the expectation that's going to be building, it's certainly not neutral, it's certainly not dry. The, the circulation that was, this is the La Nina pattern, is quickly building towards an El Nino based pattern. So next, we're taking the CFS model. We're going out not just a month, but three months. Past performance down here, the forecast here. This is outgoing long wave radiation, again, cloud cover. Uh, the blues are wetter than normal air. The yellows, drier than normal air, or cloud-free skies and more cloudy skies. Past performance down here. Here's our date line right here. You can see this building cloudy pattern getting, look at this, pretty solid here as of the past week or so, and conversely, dry air building over the maritime continent. The forecast suggests a continuation of that pattern, but also noticed it starts shifting off to the right. So this would be the rising branch of the Walker circulation. Warm, moist air coming from the ocean surface being lifted high up into the air. It condenses, creates clouds. Okay, and that is on the date line. But notice as we get into mid part of January, the center of the Walker circulation starts shifting off to the east, moving to 
theoretically 130 west. That's due south of California. We talk about east-based El Ninos, and the closer that center of the Walker circulation is to California, the higher propensity uh, theoretically for precipitation into California. Of course, that also means a lot of weather too. Also notice the forecast suggesting the dry air moving from, we'll say, the cent center of the maritime continent fading, but all starting to move to the date line. This is the beginning of the end of El Nino. This is the beginning of El Nino here. So all this suggests a true El Nino pattern moving forward. Now we play the same game, but we're going down to the surface. This is again the uh, 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 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies, the east-west component of the wind. So you can look at this in different uh, levels of the atmosphere, down at the surface or up high in the atmosphere. The effects are a little bit different, but they all are signs or signals of what El Nino is not only doing, but forecast to do as we get deeper into winter. All right, so... Oranges and yellows, westerly anomalies. This is, you can see, the building westerly wind anomaly pattern getting quite solid now in late October. This is the building easterly wind pattern over the maritime continent. Again, that da downward falling branch of the Walker circulation. Westerly anomalies forecast to basically be strong from here now the whole way into January with the easterly anomalies reflecting the same thing. Again, downward falling branch centered, if I was eyeballing here, right smack in the middle of the maritime, almost to the far, almost into the West Pacific, but not quite. This these westerly wind anomalies taking every last drop of warm water that's over in the far west Pacific, shoving it to the east in the form of Kelvin waves or a river of warm water, feeding a developing El Nino pattern. More warm water in the east Pacific means more evaporation, more energy to feed the jet stream and pre create storms and weather. All right, so let's overlay the MJO onto this. The solid red contours are the MJO. So we have this, and remember, as you get deeper into El Nino, MJO, the MJO signal starts to disappear. So here was our last reasonable MJO signal, our event back in late July, early August. We're in a very weakest of one right now, and theoretically, even a weaker one in December. But you notice the westerly winds are no longer dependent on the MJO anymore. They are taking on a life of their own. Even in the presence of this dotted contour, the inactive phase of the MJO, which is just a perpetual, sort of we're in a perpetual active phase here of the West Pacific, a perpetual inactive phase over the maritime continent, dry air, and then as we get into January, the beginnings of the end, the underpinnings, the foundation of El Nino. Now, this does not mean that El Nino and the jet stream and storms and all that are going to break down. That's going to take months for that to happen. But the beginnings of, you can see, the pendulum swinging from La Nina, where we were three over the past three years, hard to El Nino for this year. And then you get the sense of the beginning of the La Nina return swing already starting to set up as we break into the beginning of next year. And then finally, the low pass filter here. So this is real simple. This is like a low pressure bias, the, the solid black contour. We call it the El Nino indicator. It's just a low pressure bias signal. The dotted contour, the high pressure signal. So this is the El Nino signal. This is the La Nina signal. You can see we are currently under three contours, pretty much centered right over the dateline, building to a fourth contour here in a matter of a week, and a fifth contour as we get in the first week of December. And notice, here's where we were, the center of it back in June, uh, actually uh, west of the dateline, the center of that moving to, and I assume this would be the center of the Walker circulation, uh, somewhere around, just eyeballing, I'd say maybe 140 west, something like that. So north of Hawaii or even closer, somewhere between Hawaii and California. I mean, this is a very strong signal. There's nothing new here for you, those of you that have been watching this video. This model has been saying this nonstop for months now. 
but we are here. It appears to be happening. And this is all very good news. We are getting what we paid for. Be careful what you pay for. So that's the MJO thing. What's going on? Is it actually moving warm water around? Well, we take a look at the TAO buoy array, that series of buoys used for monitoring El Nino, set up after the 82-83 El Nino. The, de the impacts of that super El Nino were extremely devastating, and so NOAA decided we need to find a better way to track, and they were looking to track Kelvin waves. So here we are, East Pacific here, West Pacific here. These are the anchor lines on the buoys. The X's are the actual sensors on those anchor lines. Notice that a bunch of the sensors on this line right here are out. Okay, and there are other sensor lines that are probably all together down, but we can still get a rough idea of what's going on. We look at the 30 degree isotherm, 30 degrees centigrade. I think this was over maybe 170 last week, moving to about 168 west, so warm water trying to move a little bit. 29 degree isotherm, 158, it was at 160, so maybe a little bit of eastward movement. The 28 degree isotherm, holding at about 145. I mean, at one point it was over at 140 here, something like this. Not a whole lot of change going on here. And the 24 degree isotherms holding its depth here off of Ecuador down about 39 meters, something like that. All this is suggesting is there's piles of warm water moving off to the east. It's not changing because I don't think there is a wholesale big change in the movement. It's a steady eastward movement. And this is reflecting that. Um, and notice, no cool water here in the east. But those are the temperatures. It is the anomalies that really tell the story, the difference from normal for this time of year. And you can see, first thing I see here is two degree above normal temperatures, a big old ball. And where is that centered at? Right there, about 170 west. So coming across the date line, merging with this. So this would be Kelvin wave number seven. This is Kelvin waves four, five, and six, all balled off off of Ecuador. If anything, I'm I'm tracking where these individual isotherm lines are almost every other day to see if they're moving. If anything, the pool of warm water here in the East Pacific is building. It's grown a couple of degrees off to the west. This pool is building too. These all driven by this steady westerly wind pattern. Westerly winds here on the uh, ocean surface taking warm water, pushing it to depth. It starts traversing the Pacific. So if this is here now, it's going to take two and a half months to get to Ecuador to even erupt to the surface and then start uh, feeding the El Nino surface warm pool. So where are we? We're uh, almost the end of October to November to December. Sometime in early early to mid-January, this warm water will start being uh, erupting over here. But we know we have piles of continued westerly wind anomalies. So I don't really expect to see this disappear anytime soon. If anything, it's going to be growing as westerly winds push more warm water to depth than they just get caught in the stream tracking to the east. This is another version of that same data. It doesn't use uh, it doesn't use buoys. It uses satellite data. We'll take a look at that in a minute. But it's basically painting the same picture. Massive amounts of warm water here in the West Pacific. Another giant building pool right there, 170 West. Another massive building pool of warm water. The next Kelvin wave setting up, and yet additional warm water flowing from the West Pacific and the Maritime Continent off to the east. All this just looks absolutely fantastic. Sea level anomalies. This is the raw satellite data used to build that subsurface profile. Uh, this measures the height of the sphere of the ocean. Take out the waves, the wind waves, the tides, and is the sphere of the ocean higher or lower than normal? If the sphere is lower than normal, well, cold water at depth contracts. It'll create a divot on the ocean surface. And so that, that would not be a good thing. Likewise, warm water down at depth expands. It creates a bump on the ocean surface. So given that, what is this picture telling us? Well, there is Peru there, Ecuador, Central America, equator there, Dateline there, New Guinea there. From, and we'll just look here, that's 160 east. From 160 east, the whole other side of the Dateline, 
we have positive anomalies, 0 to 5 centimeters, 5 to 10 centimeters, 10 centimeters or higher above normal, all here in a big pool, hitting, moving into Ecuador, piles of war, months of warm water are confirmed with this data at depth, waiting their chance to erupt to the surface. This is classic El Nino. And then finally, the upper ocean heat anomaly pattern. This is my favorite chart. It goes back a year. West Pacific here, East Pacific here. Last year at this time, cold water, colder than normal water for this time of year in the East Pacific. The La Nina signal in control. Piles of warm water all sequestered in the far West Pacific, dri driven by La Nina, stronger than normal high pressure, stronger than normal trades, all here. But then late November... Trades backed off, active phase of the MJO. The, again, the MJO, we follow it, how it starts the uh, the Kelvin wave cycle. One Kelvin wave, you see warm water barely making it across the Pacific. Kelvin wave number two in January. Big Kelvin wave number three in March. An another one, number four in April. Number five in May. Number six in July, which is all feeding in and erupting now. And then... This next big pool of building warm water, number seven at least, this is looking incredibly good. All right, what's going on at the ocean surface? Yet more good news there. This is sea surface temperature anomalies. Uh, Peru, I'm sorry, Chile, Peru, Ecuador, Central America, Hawaiian Islands, equator roughly right there, dateline off, oh, right, right about there. We see lots of warm water on the surface a big signal suggesting much warmer than normal water there creating evaporation helping to feed a change in the walker circulation dragging the upward moving branch off to the east where normally there's high pressure here no moisture and colder than normal water at the surface now it's the reverse, and what that does is drags the walker circulation with it, the low-pressure bias. That feeds the storm track, pushes it into the Pacific, supercharges the jet stream and the storm track, and, of course, we get more surf, and then we get precipitation. The jet falls further south, slamming into California, bringing us rain and snow. All right, the signal continuing to build from last week, and we are seeing small but deeper pockets of that, that sort of orangish uh, warming right here, uh, the whole way out to almost the dateline now. This is, again, just good news. Nothing bad to say, at least not yet. Sea surface temperature trend for the past seven days, a light warming pattern along the equator here in the far uh, east uh, equatorial Pacific. No big surprise there. Um, all driven by Kelvin waves erupting in this area. Now, the temperatures are all really warm, so you're not going to see big dramatic changes. When we were going from La Nina and all the cold uh, water that was over here, and the first couple of Kelvin waves started erupting, things really lit up. Now it's more like we've got a pot of water that's simmering, and little bit at a time we're ratcheting, ratcheting up the temperature. It's not good. We'll see if it goes to a full boil by the time we get into late December and January, which seems very possible, but we're going in the right direction, slowly adding energy to the East Pacific warm pool. And then finally, just the overview. This is like the classic El Nino kind of signal, all this warm water in like a triangle right here from, uh, we'll say, Chile out to the Dateline up to Baja with the center right on the equator. You can see temperatures quite warm. Classic El Nino will take it. Sea surface temperature trend in the Nino 1.2 region. This is the area right there by Ecuador and the Galapagos Islands. Temperatures down just a little bit at plus 1.755 degrees above normal. Neutral is right here. It's not unexpected that the Nino 1.2 region temperatures start fading as some of that warm water starts getting driven off to the west. The main, the official El Nino monitoring region, this is at the Nino 3.4 area. This is on the equator from a point south of California out to about the dateline. Temperatures down just one day at plus 1.272. Now, uh, 
This is actually two tenths of a degree below normal. We'll go look at some other data here in just a second. But you can see the general trend staying warm, if not trying to build. Um, this is looking good. This is the weekly OISST sea surface temperature anomalies for Nino 1, 2, 3.4, and 4. This is the one that matters here. So temperatures were up uh, the early part or mid-September to plus 1.7. They've backed off a little bit, but not as much as the models suggested, which suggests that maybe this El Nino is building a little bit stronger than what the models suggest. Now, you also see sea surface temperatures falling in, falling in the Nina 1.2 region. We were up at, what, 3.4 degrees above normal. Now we're down to 2.3. But the general trend and Nino 4, this is out towards the dateline, building up to 1.3 degrees. This temperature at Nino 3 at 2.1 degrees. So uh, just let's do something. Just as a point of reference. So here's neutral sea surface temperatures. If they're a half a degree, but half a degree below to half a degree above, that's considered normal. If you're a half a degree above half a degree to one degree, that's considered weak El Nino. If you're uh, one degree up to one and a half degrees, that's moderate El Nino. Now remember. These temperatures are 2.2 degrees below normal. So, and the data we just saw showed that temperatures are right at 1.5 degrees. So, right on the border between medium to strong El Nino, and we're just getting started here. Here's the sea surface temperature anomaly trend going the whole way from uh, right off of Ecuador to as far in the West Pacific as you can go over the past year. You see the beginnings of the first Kelvin waves hitting here in March and building and building and building. Now the intensity now isn't quite as strong as that, but the aerial coverage of these warm anomalies is building. The interesting stuff is to about 140. We need this to get out to about somewhere out here, but you can just see the first little signs of it right here of a building signal here as well. We think at some point all this is going to interconnect over the next two to three months, maybe January some time frame. This will be a later El Nino than normal. A lot of times the sea surface temperatures peak out in November to early December. We're thinking this is going to be more like late December, early January. Let's dig a little deeper. All right, so right here, October 21st, 2023, here is our existing warm signal, looking pretty good. We're going to compare it to two other Super El Ninos. Here is 2015, and we can maybe, well, I'll just do it this way. I'll just go back and forth. There and there. Okay, 2015 has more warm water out here, but... The peak warm waters can't even compare to what we're experiencing right now. But then we go and we add 1997 to the, the mix right here. And you can see there is no comparison. Look at the depth of the cooking warm waters here in 97. It went out to about this time of year to about 65 west. Here's where we are this year. Can't even compare. So this year, at least looking at this, is stronger then, or at least equivalent to 2015, but can't touch 1997. Sea surface current analysis driven by winds, trade winds. Uh, New Guinea right there, the equator right here. I don't know if you can see this, but the arrows or the streamline functions really driving hard to the west. They start moving north of the equator somewhere around in here. I actually put a little dot right there. That's at what one set. That's basically the date line right there. Then we'll go and we'll go look in the East Pacific, the far East Pacific. The exact opposite happens. Tra the trades, so the current, I should say, stronger than normal, probably been dr being driven by easterly anomalies. They meet uh, somewhere around this dot here, that again would be that upward branch of the Walker circulation right there. And then we'll overlay sea surface temperatures, not anomalies, actual sea surface temperatures. You see this building warm pool right there, suggesting the convergence of westerly anomalies and easterly anomalies. The suspicion is that this pocket of warm air 
our warm water will start moving east as the center of the upward branch of the Walker circulation and the low pressure bias start moving east as we get deeper into January, maybe even February. And that's when peak storm activity, we'll just put it right here. If the center, if this warm pool here is actually situated down here and the low pressure bias is here, this would be about what is that? That is 150 west, even 144 right there. And California is just right there. The jet stream will just be dipping down through this, tapping piles of warm, moist air, slamming right into California, northern California, central California, maybe southern California. The real question is, it's the at they call what do they used to call it? Pineapple Express. They call it an atmospheric river now. But if the jet is pulling in somewhere along this stretch and tapping warm, moist air from down here, dragging that with it, you get a I don't want to say a flood, but a river of wet air pushing into California the whole way across the United States. Just, just the moisture follows the jet, goes right across the southern tier of states. And whatever drought, I know folks in Texas, I uh, got some emails and comments from them. They're just going, we're dying and need we need water. Well, the hope is if this El Nino does his forecast, all that will be resolved in quick order. Okay, so we've talked about the ocean. We've talked about low pressure biases and things that are happening in the West Pacific. But do, over the Pacific Ocean, does the atmosphere think that El Nino is going on? Well, we can look at the difference between Tahiti and Darwin. Tahiti is where those east winds, the outflow from the Walker circulation, the dry air are. Dar I'm sorry, Tahiti, I'm sorry, Darwin is where that is. Tahiti is over the Pacific where the opposite is happening. The West Anomalies and the wet air theoretically is happening. Uh, the difference in pressure between the two, if it's there's a negative difference, that means Tahiti is experiencing lower pressure relative to Darwin. Today's index minus 22.12. Past couple of days, well, dropping. This is exactly what you'd want to see. Now you go back here. You go, well, it's been negative, but not super negative. But we have been negative for 60 or 61 days in a row, two months. That is a good sign. The 30-day trend, that goes back 30 days. We're at minus 8.59. Uh, where were we? You see, we were actually deeper in the, in the low-pressure bias, or Pacific was experiencing more low pressure in September than we are now but we think that is changing. The 90-day, so this would be the MJO indicator, active inactive phase. This sort of smells of a weak inactive phase or a weak pause in El Nino. The 90-day average, the El Nino indicator, minus 11.7. Where were we? Oh, there we go. A month ago, minus 8.54. This suggests the steady build towards El Nino with minor variations. Let's go look at a graph. Here's the 30-day moving SOI, that 30-day average. Here's zero. If you're above the line, you're in La Nina. If you're below the not line, cons you know, and really, you got to be like 10 or above or 10 and below. So this, the downward spikes, the active phase, the MJO, the upward spikes, the inactive phase. If you're positive, that must mean that the inactive phase of the MJO is dominant over the active phase. We got to January this year, boom, fell off a cliff. Had a little stall there in July. Today, we're negative. Yeah, well, we're above minus 15, but I think this, that's going to be rather short-lived, and we're going to start falling off a cliff here pretty soon. It's going to go deep. 30-day average, you can see that fall, fall and hang down at minus 25. And if the 90-day average is at minus 15, then you know you're close to the peak of El Nino. The raw sea surface temperature trend forecast for the Nino 3.4 region, the official El Nino monitoring region. So where are we? We're in mid-October now. Temperatures at 1.5 degrees, and that's pretty much what we're seeing on all the data. Supposed to hold into November, and then boom, here you go. And look at this. Almost every run of the model, this thing is inching up a little bit more, going to plus 1.95 degrees. And then as you get into January, mid-January, temperature is going to 
2 degrees, right at the bare minimum threshold for a single reading for a super El Nino. I don't think we're going there because you have to average that out over three months. Okay, so a three-month average of, of December, January, and February, somewhere probably just eyeballing it, maybe around 1.8 eight degrees. So strong, strong El Nino. The PDF corrected version, and I think this guy is probably out to lunch at this point, suggests temperatures actually falling to 1.4, 1.45 degrees above normal in November, then heading up into about the 1.7 range. So even in the most conservative view, let's say we'll use this 1.7 here and up here at 2.0 so maybe you end up with a 1.85 or something like that or 1.75 either way both suggesting strong el nino but we don't have to make up numbers here we actually have the updated consensus model every el nino model that exists on the planet statistic models down here dynamic models here the statistic average i'll show you there what is that it looks like about 1.5 degrees that looks like the pdf corrected version of the cfs model the dynamic model average looks like right at two degrees okay um let's dig down here a little bit okay so here is the average of the dynamic models right here two degrees 1.979 and this is in Three month, oh, and these are three months average, November, December, January, December, January, February. So the dynamic models suggesting bore right at the hairy edge of super El Nino. The statistic models, 1.83, 1.76, 1.77. That's still strong, uh, strong El Nino. Now, Who's going to win out, the dynamic models or the statistic models? I tend to put the, my money on the dynamic models, but let's go look at the CFS model. Here it is. Oh, it is the lowest of the batch here. They're using the PDF corrected version, 1.59, 1.56, where almost every other model is up in the, well, not every, I'm maybe exaggerating a little here, but two or higher. So I would say this is probably the cfs model if anything is a little bit on the low side and other models suggesting higher either way it seems pretty fair assumption we're heading towards at a solid strong el nino all right so let's wrap this up real quick clouds steady near the dateline but they've been building since june 24th okay that's the uh the up, upflow of the Walker circulation. Equatorial current continues to suggest Walker circulation effects at the surface. Uh, the North Pacific jet stream, solid. It was solid, not so strong at the moment, but that all suggests that maybe limited enhancement from an El, El Nino at the moment. The SOI, Southern Oscillation Index, is steadily negative and getting more so that way. The west wind anomalies are building over the Kelvin wave generation areas since July 15th and are forecast to build even more. Kelvin wave number six is erupting and Kelvin wave number seven is developing. Bring it on. Active MJO number eight and maybe Kelvin wave number eight are forecast beyond that. The ENSO models all suggest more of the same moving forward. And if anything, the CFS model is on the weak side. So our guess is we're going to keep our eyes out looking for continued develop, development of the upflow of the Walker circulation as it builds towards El Nino. The west wind anomaly pattern, we expect that to continue over the Kelvin wave generation area at least into early part of January. At least one more active MJO or Kelvin wave opportunity is forecast. Ocean and atmospheric coupling certainly seems to be happening. We're just waiting for it to strengthen now. Pico and I projection, that would be the El Nino projection, maybe 1.7 to 1.8. Let us know what you think. Write it up in the comments and we can talk about it. So for right now, the North Pacific from a swell production standpoint is not nearly as impressive as it was last week. That said, Hawaii is going to get some swell for a couple of days. Not bad. U.S. West Coast, not so much. But lo and behold, a whole series of southern hemi swells, not big but steady. That should provide something for California to keep us all busy while we wait for the jet stream to get supercharged. Beyond, El Nino looks like a given at this point. The exact strength, we can arm wrestle about it, but somewhere 
at a minimum 1.5 to 2 degrees above normal, probably more in the 1.75 to 1.8 range, which all puts us in solid strong El Nino status. We don't think there's any chance of us going into super El Nino status. The one little cool thing about all this is it's not going to be an early El Nino. It'll be a later El Nino. So the effects in terms of storm production might take a little while to get going. Okay, we had our one little early season storm. We might might take a little bit, but I, I think as we get into Thanksgiving, Christmas, and January and February, things are going to get very, very busy. Make your preparations now. Make sure you're in shape. Get your training uh, regimen, uh, you know, finalized. Get your board orders in, your wetsuits, all that kind of stuff. Because I have a feeling once the storm door opens, it isn't going to close and we're going to be on the run for months. All right, that's our forecast for this week. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up. We certainly appreciate it. Send us a comment. If you have questions or concerns, I know this is all pretty detailed. If you'd like to make a small donation, we appreciate that too. And other than that, we're on track to do this again next week, same time, same channel. Thanks for watching. We'll see you then.